the bottom line is in maximum two months two and a half months the city of eastern Aleppo at this rate may be totally destroyed it's been nearly three weeks since the Syrian government began its offensive to retake eastern Aleppo a bombardment of airstrikes by the regime and Russia but both deny targeting hospitals. The Syrian regime has been gaining ground in the rebel-held areas and says it plans to fight on until its mission is accomplished. To continue uh, the fight with the rebels is they leave Aleppo. They have to, there's no other options. We, we won't accept that terrorists will take control of any part of Syria, not only Aleppo. Eastern Aleppo is one of the major urban strongholds of the Syrian opposition. And some analysts say whoever wins the battle for Aleppo will win Syria's war. While the battle rages in the east, the Syrian regime is keen to show that in the areas it controls, life goes on. Syrian Arab News Agency recently released this video, appearing to show Syrians enjoying the nightlife in Aleppo. But for nearly 250,000 people trapped in the besieged rebel side of the city, it's a different story. The regime has said it will guarantee safety for residents and rebel fighters who choose to leave. But many say they fear arrest. And there are reports the regime is blocking routes used for supplies and to escape the city. It's a siege designed to starve opponents into submission and force their surrender. Thanks to your actions today, Syrians will continue to lose their lives in Aleppo and beyond. One of us, perversely the President of the United Nations Security Council, is intent on allowing the killing to continue. The battle for Aleppo is also playing out at the round table of the United Nations. On Saturday, the UN Security Council voted on a draft resolution calling for Russia and Syria to halt airstrikes in Aleppo. Russia used its veto to oppose it and also tabled its own resolution focusing on restoring the ceasefire agreed in September. That was also voted down. Given that the crisis in Syria is at a critical stage, when it is particularly important that there be a coordination of the political effort, this waste of time is inadmissible. With a complex web of alliances and a stark warning that time may be running out, what can be done now to save Aleppo? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me here in the studio is Ahmad al Burai. He is a lecturer at Istanbul Aydin University. And from Dubai, I'm joined by Monsar Akbik. He is a member of the Syrian Opposition Coalition. Thanks both so much for joining us. Thank you. Let me start with a rather broad question, I think. Um, all the efforts being made, constant negotiations, drafted resolutions at the United Nations, yet Syria has continued its decline. Was an opportunity missed here to reach a political resolution at some point, or is this a quagmire at its worst? Let me start in the studio, Ahmed. I think we all know it is no secret that Syria uh, has been trapped on a crumpling cliff, and it is already a failed state, and the, the whole a powers in the region, whether international or regional powers, um, they are not serious, they are not genuine in their claim that they want to find a way out, they want to find a solution to this ongoing violence. And uh, I think this is, the, is the, the, the mess of this opportunity is normal because again, um, the, the actors on the ground are not interested from one hand. From the other hand, um, the, the people, they lost the confidence as well as the trust that there might be any kind of solution to the, uh, to the, the conflict uh, in Syria as far as Assad is still in power, which is a big problem for the Syrian people. Monsar, go ahead. Yeah, well, we have, we have seen what happened in the Security Council. Uh, there is uh, 
a huge tension between the Western group and Russia. And Russia vetoed the resolution uh, which was uh, proposed by France and Spain. And uh, in short, the resolution was calling for the halt of bombing from the skies, uh, cessation of hostilities, and allowing humanitarian aid to enter Aleppo. Now, since this uh, Russia did not agree on that resolution, did not pass, this means that the bombing will continue and the aid will not enter Aleppo. This means that there are 275,000 civilians there. They, are, they don't have food, they don't have medicine, and also uh, they have short of water. So the humanitarian catastrophe is going to continue in Aleppo and uh, to a higher scale. And uh, we are not seeing now any light at the end of the tunnel on the short term. Mm -hmm. How we can convince the Russians to just stop the bombing and try to find some way out of this, um, this political bottleneck. Now, both of you believe that Assad must go. Syria cannot move forward. It can't rebuild if Assad is still part of the political landscape in Syria. But he has support. He has some support from within Syria, and even more importantly, he has support from very powerful allies in Russia and Iran as well. Having said that, can he be completely dropped from the equation, as I know you both wish he were, but just because that's what you want doesn't mean that's necessarily how it's going to play out. Ahmed, is there a way to go forward if he refuses to leave? You know, the, the, the already the revolution in Syria started because of this man. He and his family are the crux of the, the problem itself. That's why it is a cynical, it is rather ridiculous and absurd to have any kind of political solution if Assad stays in power. The people are fed up with the density of the Assad family who have been controlling Syria for more than a four decades. So he should go, yes. Of course, there is a, a support from unequivocal support from Russia as well as Iran. They believe that he is the guardian of their interest in Syria, and they have been supporting him. But they should know that they are betting on the uh, losing horse. But as you say that, you say they're betting on a losing horse. But from their perspective, they're winning. Yeah, they could think so, but again, the formula is different. People at the end, people and right will win. And these people didn't sacrifice all these uh, amount of blood of their uh, beloved relatives, families, their houses. They left the places for nothing. It doesn't make any sense, again, to tell them that let's go, let's have a U-return and let's go back uh, as if nothing happened. There are lots of uh, massacres, lots of genocide happened. The international community is on the stake. The credibility of the so-called international community is on the stake. And the people need to say otherwise, the whole region would never trust the so-called international community, and things may get uh, worse and worse. Okay. Monser, people, particularly in the West, do sympathize with your cause. The concern, though, is that Egyptians basically had the same dream when they went out into Tahir Square that your party does as well. Do you think Syria, though, can achieve what Egypt was not able to? Yes, but it will take uh, time. Now, the people, uh, when they took to the streets in 2011 in Syria, uh, uh, me being Syrian, I know how difficult and how near to impossible it was for people to, to do that. It, it needed a lot of courage uh, because Assad has these intelligent forces. Uh, and uh, people, they really cannot even tell a joke or even uh, write something on a social media against the government. Immediately, the secret police, they will take them and they will torture them. Many times, they torture them to death. So this is a you know, very tyrannical regime that is, people are living in fear. So uh, they took to the streets, and Assad used uh, life ammunition. He shot uh, at, uh, at the uh, protesters, and many died. And next day, also, they came out, and they continued. Uh, for many months until it turned into, as you can see, uh, armed struggle. So, uh, so many sacrifices have been made, but the Syrian people has proven 
uh, and has shown that there is no way back. So this tyranny has to end, even if this revolution is going to continue many years to come, the tyranny will end. There, the Assad cannot really have a uh, military victory in this war. This war will continue many years if he still thinks that. So unless he changes his calculations and agree to a political process that will lead to a political change, a real political change in Syria, then he will be just dreaming okay. of a military victory that they will never have. And ideally, Monsar, you are asking for a multi-party democracy in Syria. But I'm asking you, composed of which groups, which parties? There are so many rebel factions now fighting with competing interests. How do you envision an actual functional democracy now? Uh, well, the, uh, there is a process. Uh, basically, uh, um, there is a Geneva communique, which has been agreed between all the countries, including the P5, including Russia and the United States. Now, this the roadmap for political transition, transition in Syria is basically what has been agreed between the Syrians themselves, whether the opposition or the regime, and all the countries who are concerned that there is a roadmap into a transitional government. Now, the transitional governing body uh, is going to have uh, these duties in order to solve the problem of the military factions, solve the problem of gathering the arms, solve the, uh, all these uh, issues that is, you know, the chaos that happened in the country. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that it's going to happen within one or two days or two weeks, but this is something that the transitional government need to deal with. Maybe it will take a couple of years in order to gather all these arms and to gather all these factions and go into a central government again. Okay. Ahmed, do you have the same outlook? Can these various factions and parties be brought together? You know, this is the pretext of the Americans as well as the, the Russians. They believe that if Assad, let's take the scenario, Assad has gone, and now the day after. That's the problem of the Obama administration in Libya after the, the, uh, the regime was toppled. So there is a vacuum political, vacuum political void who is going to fill, uh, to fill that void. It's the, the, the problem here, and the poll is in the court of the opposition. I believe that the moderate opposition, what we, we call the moderate opposition, and the American like to uh, label the opposition a uh, partisan factions with moderate and extremist and as if they're one <clears throat> sorry as if they're one um, in one pot so uh, the, the the opposition with the wide spectrum are not able to uh, present the international community with a genuine uh, alternative mm -hmm. to Assad but again I go back to the uh, Egyptian model because this is the Arab Spring as a whole in order to understand the whole picture you need to take it all uh, the Americans and the, the the Russians in Syria from the one hand they claim that if Assad go what will happen now what happened in Egypt it was a very fruitful a democratic process but who toppled that democratic process it's the west by supporting Sisi, the one who committed the seas the, the the coup against the egyptian president the first democratically elected president the people of this region can have democracy they can practice real freedom of speech they can have uh, they can express their own opinion but the west need to understand that the people in this region do have the right to do these things they can make mistakes they're not professional as the west they're still amateurs but they should have at least a chance to practice this otherwise we will stay on this vicious circle ongoing violence and they will stay say who is going to replace him? It is, and again, it is cynical that a population of more than 23 million people, Syrian, that they cannot have someone who can replace the so-called Assad. Okay, Ahmad al burai I'm going to let you have the last word. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank both our guests, Monsar Akbik, as well, for joining us on the Newsmakers. Thank you.